good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to the Conversations with Dr. Don Show. The show is produced and broadcast from the Portland, Oregon metropolitan area. And for your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique one of a kind individuals. And we'll talk about the topic of the show, gun violence, public health, and public policy. And we'll talk about any other thing that comes up. And there'll be some other things coming up, I'm sure, based on what's been going on recently in our country. How are you, Dr. Donahoe? It's been a tough week. Tough but week. It's nice to see you. Good to see you again. Yeah. And this is about your 36th show, is it? Or no? I, I lost count. <laughs> we lost count. <laughs> yeah. uh, Martin has been on so many times in the future because he's got such important stuff he talks about, and he's really a, a sharp guy and knows what's going on, and I love him. <laughs> the feeling's mutual. So uh, the show usually goes in two parts, and the first ha half is uh, what I call the bio segment where I talk to my guests about who they are, and I'm sure all of you viewers out there have seen, has seen Dr. Donahue a lot of times, and you know who he is by now, but he will do a brief overview of who he is, and then we'll go right into the subject of the show, gun violence, public health, and public policy. And how are you feeling right now? I'm feeling well. I had a nice day with my daughter today. We went trampolining. Trampolining? We did. Did yeah. you jump? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> she outjumped me, but uh, it was just a struggle to keep up with her and also keep the big kids away because they tend to be pretty boisterous and um, fly around all over the place. So I'm blocking out big kids while letting her enjoy herself. Oh, well, you're going to let her come on the show and talk to the viewers? Sure. She said she wants to dance, but she, she's been a little obstreperous on and off, so we'll see how she does. At its tender age. Ah, oh, what do you expect? <laughs> She's going to be turning three in a week. Three in a week. You're uh -huh. getting old, fella. I, I am getting old, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's start off with you talking about who you are. You've been through the routine a lot of times, so let's see how long you will take to talk about who Martin Donahoe is. Sure. I, I'm a physician. I practice internal medicine part-time. I uh, have a great interest in the area of public health and social justice, which really incorporates for me environmental health, food safety and food justice, reproductive rights, uh, gun violence. I was trained in medical humanities, so a lot of my teaching involves using great literature as a pedagogical approach to teaching medical students and residents about some of the social and cultural and environmental and economic contributors to health and illness. Uh, and I do some activist work, mostly on behalf of left-wing causes. But most importantly, I'm a dad, and I have an almost three-year-old daughter that is keeping me young, that I'm <laughs> raising by myself with the help of my mom and a couple of great nannies, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I've never been happier in my life. So we're just um, living the crazy life of doing things with a three-year-old. It's get up and go to the trampoline place or the bouncy house or the library or OMSI or Children's Museum. There's, uh, she's got different ideas of what she wants to do every day, so she kind of runs the show. <laughs> I'm not in charge. Your mother or your daughter? Oh, my daughter's in charge. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's, she's in charge, and she knows it. So, <laughs> uh, how did you get to be the way that you are? How did you get to be that way? Why did you learn that? Or, or the, these interests? Uh, I think it was very fortunate parenting, um, parents who were very devoted to my upbringing and my brother's upbringing. I have very intelligent, committed brothers, one of whom is a uh, tutor slash screenwriter slash uh, Harvard and Oxford trained Victorian lit expert, and mm. one of whom is a Harvard MBA CFO type who's also doing lots of good work in the world and they have between them four amazing kids and two wonderful wives so I, I guess it's just being surrounded with really supportive family uh, and especially growing up parents who exposed to me to many different ideas mm -hmm. and uh, exposed me to the suffering of others and tried to instill in me empathy and that's that's hard to do I'm figuring out how to how to do that with my daughter I think some of it might be innate um, but I think a lot of it just has to do with exposing children to as much as you can 
and then helping them to interpret it. It's, I, I kind of look at child rearing as um, something like bowling when they put those little side protectors in the lanes yeah. so, <laughs> and the ball can bounce back and forth and, and I'm just the side protectors kind of keeping her from <laughs> going too far astray. <laughs> But I, I really lucked out with her. So she's a, she's just a great kid. So what kind of medicine do you practice? Internal medicine. So mm -hmm. adults, and now I work mostly in the hospital. Um, in the past, I've done primary care, and uh, I enjoy taking care of a real wide range of problems. I never wanted to be a specialist because I didn't want to focus on just one part of the body or one organ system, and I wanted to be in a field where I could listen to patient stories and hear about how their home life, their psychological state of mind, their emotions, their relationships were co contributing to their health. And it's, it's easier to do that when you're in general internal medicine. Do you uh, see old people too? Predominantly old people, but I see oh, everyone good. from I want 18 to ask you on about, up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, I get that all the time. Well, it was funny the other day. My mom had her arm was really hurting, and I was I was moving it around and doing the usual shoulder exam, and Madeline just looked up and there's the tiniest little mole here, and she looked up and said. I think I found the source of the problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> the almost three-year-old. Yeah, she, she loves to wear my stethoscope and listen to her animals and put Band-Aids on them. So she's kind of a little, little mini doctor in training. We'll see. And you call she can do whatever Maddie, she wants huh? to do. Madeline, Maddie, Mrs. Bugs, Mrs. Chops, the professor. <laughs> um, yeah, she, so. Okay, then what else can I ask you before we start talking about the subject? Uh, Okay, any, any persons from the past or alive today that you admire or admired? Or Outside of my family, of course. Yeah, uh, sure. I would say uh, Carl Sagan, mm -hmm. uh, Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, Barbara Ehrenreich, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders. Uh, uh, Donald Trump? Uh, he's an execrable human being. Unfortunately, I should withdraw the question. <laughs> right, <laughs> this um, is a friendly uh, discussion today. Yeah, but anyway. Right. So, shall we continue on with the main subject of the show? Wonderful. All right. Uh, gun violence, public health, and public policy. Gun violence. What do you mean by gun violence? Well, you could look at that from a few different ways. You could look at it in terms of the type of violence that takes place in much of the world through war, since most wars today are occurring in developing nations and involve two armies shooting each other with guns. Um, many of the wars that are going on do not involve high-powered weaponry or bombs or tanks or airplanes. And, and the U.S. is the number one arms supplier to the rest of the world. So in some sense, we're responsible for that. But I think in there's terms that of... gun violence, and there's other... That, that's a, a very important form of gun violence. But I think in terms of this show, mm -hmm. uh, what we were going to talk about was gun violence in the United States. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, public health, public policy, I think we all know what those are. And you being a physician and other things you've said about yourself, we can see why you would be interested in public health and public policy. And uh, I'm not going to talk about Trump anymore toward, toward, toward the end. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I was backwashing a bit there. So. <laughs> First question. Uh, describe your experience with guns, your personal experience with guns. Well, that's interesting. I, I, growing up, my brothers and I loved to play with toy guns. Uh, never owned a BB gun because of Christmas story. And I had BB the, guns. You'll shoot your eye out whole thing. Oh, you never <laughs> shot your eye out though. No, right, Red Ryder. Um, <laughs> right, right. But we had uh, we had little pellet guns and we'd hold up badminton rackets and just kind of shoot at each other. It was lots of fun. And uh, I uh, have been skeet shooting, which was also a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And my cousins who live in Canada, they and their children have guns because they basically hunt and fish for all their food. And so my cousin's daughter, I'll call her my second cousin or niece, or I don't know what, what it would be called, but basically by age 14, she could kill and skin and gut and do the whole thing Sarah Palin style to a moose, but they did it to eat. Um, They're still doing that nowadays? Oh yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll grow some of their own vegetables and they'll buy the rest at the store, but they pretty much subsist on what they hunt and fish. And they live uh, just across the border from International Falls in Fort Francis uh, on Rainy Lake, just above Minnesota. My personal experience with guns though as an adult was very different. 
Uh, I've never known personally someone who's died of gun violence, but I have had a lot of patients who have died of gun violence. And you realize when you see it up close as a physician um, that it's very graphic, it's very violent, it's very ugly, it's not like on TV. Um, the uh, horror of watching a child or an adult slowly bleed out from a gun injury, of seeing part of someone's skull blown off. These are the kind of things that, that I think the only other people that really see this other than those who work in emergency rooms. And you've seen some of these. Oh yeah, throughout 25 years of practicing medicine are people who are in the military. Oh yes. And um, it's, it's something that, that's awful. And it's often something that's unexpected uh, because um, when someone is shot, and it might be a teenager or a young adult, their family's not expecting to come into the emergency room or get a call that their kid's been shot and is dying. Um, when somebody dies of metastatic, metastatic breast cancer or something like that, there's usually, it's expected, someone is sure. elderly, the family has had time to prepare. So the grief that you see with victims of gun violence is, is just simply heart-wrenching. Mm -hmm. So that's your experience with gun violence mm -hmm. and on a personal level with, between human beings in our country. Yeah, there's more gun, more gun violence in the future now, you think, in our country? Unfortunately, I think yes. Um, there are, in the United States, between 265 and 300 million guns. We have half the world's supply of guns that are owned personally by individuals, not by soldiers, just in the United States. Um, intriguingly, half of those are owned by just 3% of the population. And really? So those individuals own about 17 guns apiece. Why would people have that many guns? Well, that's that a good small question. I, I think some of them might be interested in the structure or the history of firearms, and there's a very interesting history. If you're interested in the history of warfare or the development of guns, or you like to shoot and you like to have different types of shotguns for hunting, or you have some that have been passed on to you by relatives, I can understand that. I think some are owned simply by people also who are maybe firearm fetishists or um, those who are uh, thinking that the apocalypse is coming and that they need multiple firearms to protect themselves. Some are criminals. Some are probably members of organized crime. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to say. Okay. How Half of those guns, by the way, that are stored in, in people's homes are stored unsafely. Okay. You're going to talk about that? Other than to say if a gun doesn't have a safety lock on and the ammunition kept in a safe place that's separate from the gun, that it's not stored safely. Again, away from children, too. Well, suppose something's going on and you want to protect yourself in your house and the gun's here and the ammunition is someplace else. How, how, how does that work? How do you get to the both of them together before the guy comes in and thumps you on the head? Well, that's an interesting question um, because it's often said that the only thing that stops a, a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And so this has been looked at. Uh, the largest study to date looked at 14,000 uh, burglaries and robberies in which there was direct contact, so robberies in which there's direct contact between the criminal and the victim. Mm -hmm. Out of those 14,000 cases, the victim drew a gun only 127 times. When the victim grew a gun, drew a gun, the chance of that victim being injured was 11%. For all the other victims who, of robbery who never drew a gun, the chance of them being injured was 11%. The amount of property taken was the exact same in those who drew the gun and in those who didn't. It is extraordinarily rare that someone has a gun in the home or carries a gun on the street that they are actually able to use successfully to thwart a crime or to thwart injury to themselves. It is orders of magnitude more common that having a gun in the home will lead to an unexpected homicide or suicide. Mm -hmm. Rather than protecting oneself from Correct. violence from somebody else. Correct. Boy. How has gun violence affected you as a physician? You, you mentioned a little about well, that. Well, right. That's, that's the personal experience that I've had. And I think that's what makes me passionate about this. And as a person who's interested in public health and public policy, too, I'm concerned because back in the 1990s, Congress actually cut the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention funding to study gun violence and the epidemiology of what is a major public health problem. 
Um, in the United States each year, 33,000 people die from gun violence and another 84,000 are injured. And this is a $230 billion health problem. So you can think about comparing this to other health problems like tobacco and alcohol, obesity and so on. This is right up there as one of the major health problems, the one of the major contributors to death and to chronic illness and chronic how does, disease. How does that compare with other, other countries, other industrial oh, countries? We have 25 times the rate of homicide in the U.S. than other developed times. countries and eight times the rate of suicide in this country. So the fact that they withdrew funding from the CDC w was in some sense absolutely ridiculous. It's basically saying to our top public health scientists, do not study this problem. And perhaps if we ignore it, there's not much that we can do to make it go away. And then of course Congress will say, when someone's trying to pass a common sense gun law, show us the data that this will work. And the CDC will have to say, well, we've been prevented from gathering this data. There's been a lot of confusion as to what is meant by the Second Amendment. There's been different interpretations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keeping bare arms and for individuals or just militias or what? Well, it's interesting. I think, I think the, that those who support broad access to guns in the United States don't understand how to read a subordinate clause. Um, a subordinate clause. Right. Okay. The, the, basically what starts the Second Amendment, a, a well-regulated militia yes, being necessary to the security of a free state, subordinate clause, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Mm -hmm. And what's intriguing is if you go to the NRA court headquarters, they don't have the whole Second Amendment written on the, the banner that's in the entryway. They just have the second half, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh -huh. But one could argue, uh, by the same token, we might say the right of a free nation to be safe from house fires or from fires in buildings or arson, uh, the people uh, shall have the right to keep and bear fire trucks. Yeah. I don't think anyone would interpret that as saying everyone should own or be able to own a fire truck. I think what that would be saying is that the people should organize fire departments, or in the case of the Second Amendment, militias, and the fire departments would own fire trucks and those in militias would own guns. Mm. Is there a serious difference from countries, between countries about the uh, protecting themselves and uh, having the general population have all the guns they want to and those nations who have restrictions on how many guns a person can, can own? Well, the greater the restrictions, the, the lower the levels of homicide, suicide, and accidental shootings. And for instance, it dropped tremendously in Australia a few decades back after a mass shooting in Tasmania where the Australian government just said enough, There's no more guns. And uh, it's a, relative, a society that's relatively free of gun violence. I think one of the problems is that, that much gun violence that takes place today is impulsive sp and spontaneous. For instance, if you look at suicides, most suicides are not well thought out suicides where the person comes up with a plan, is thinking about it for days. These are suicides that take place by gun, for instance. Yes, okay. Some people who are, say, terminally ill and want to take their own lives or those who are incredibly depressed might sort of gather pills and sort of get the courage up to do it. But, but most episodes of gun-inflicted suicide are impulsive, are, um, the crises are self-limiting. And in fact, if you look at 90% of those who survive an attempt at suicide using a gun, 90% of them do not go on to kill themselves later. Mm -hmm. Only 10% go on to suicide later. So these are people who clearly were going through a crisis mm -hmm. and whew, made it out of it, although it's depending on how bad a shot they were, um, could suffer chronic brain damage or other facial malformations or collapsed lung and the co chronic pulmonary disease or heart disease. Um, if you have a gun in the home, you have between two and 10 times the higher, a higher rate of suicide, depending on which study you look at, and some are better than others. But what that means is, is that higher rate of suicide is not just for the owner of the gun, but it's also for anyone else who lives in the home. So even if a father buys a gun, 
the spouse and the children have a rate of suicide that's between two and ten times higher because of access to that gun. Mm -hmm. uh, it also increases your risk threefold of dying from homicide and 75 percent of those homicides are from someone that you know. So basically, again, a spontaneous act, an argument, leads to what in the old days might have been a fist fight or at worst somebody grabs a steak knife from the drawer and stabs somebody. Now they shoot them and that you can't, you can't take the bullet back. Um, and so the victims of those violent acts, unfortunately, are often women. So this is in some sense a women's rights issue. But it's just gotten so crazy in the United States that, that, that with open carry laws and people carrying guns on campus and high schools having metal detectors and you have to take a step back and look at the rest of the developed world and think you know have we gone nuts in this country why is it that, that it's harder to get for instance a, a, a license to drive a boat or to buy Sudafed at a pharmacy than it is to get a gun so you're in favor of some sort of gun control or gun management or regulations? Well, it, it, uh, there's a strong part of me that feels that really we should go back to the, to the state where those who are allowed to carry weapons are the ones who are serving in a militia. Now, some people feel like they have to have a stockpile of weapons because the government's going to come for them. The U.S. government's going to come in black helicopters and invade their farm. You know, I'll tell you, if, if the government wants to come for you, They've got tanks, they've got bunker buster bombs, they've got stealth bombers, got an arsenal of guns and semi-automatic weapons in your basement is not going to protect you if they're coming for you. So, so um, they're a couple of steps ahead of the regular populace yeah, it's not, in terms it's, of their arms. It's not going to happen. And looking at mm -hmm. local police forces and those kinds of people and mm -hmm. the stuff they've got to protect themselves from riots, and so there's no comparison. Mm -hmm compared to ordinary citizens. No, and, and I think, I think that's, that, that um, the, I can imagine, of course, having guns for those who shoot for subsistence, those who go hunting. Yeah. I think, I think that's fine. I think that's, in fact, that's a much closer way of identifying with the animals that you're eating. I mean, it's very easy for me to go in and buy a shrink wrap steak in the store. Um, I have more respect, actually, for someone who goes out and kills a moose and eats the moose and uses all parts of the moose than for myself. I'm just not the kind of guy who can do that. I, it just makes me a little nervous and I wouldn't want a gun in my home with a child. Um, but certainly, I, I think there are certain common sense laws that the majority of the, a large majority of the U.S. faces and in fact a large majority of NRA members uh, support um, that, that Congress has failed to enact. The origins of violence in humans the origins and violence, that's a pretty broad uh, concept. Humans have been violent toward each other before guns. Well, it's interesting because there, there's a lot of violence between species throughout the animal kingdom. Yeah. Uh, much of this species involves fighting for mates. Um, usually it just involved injuries. It's rare that two males will fight over a mate and one will die. It's sort of fighting until one gets injured or one sort of shows his dominance and the other one walks away. Now, of course, there are what are called sneaker males, who are the ones who often impregnate <laughs> the women and perpetuate their genes and in away. the population. <laughs> and so there's various reproductive strategies that animals use to get around that. Yeah. Um, uh, gorilla infanticide is very common. We're looking at the close, closer primates to us, yeah. uh, up to about, some anthropologists say, half of gorilla babies are killed by infanticide. It's basically a new alpha male coming in, wants the female gorillas to be in estrus and, and ready to reproduce. And the only thing to do that is to kill their infants and, and make them reproductively ready so that that gorilla can father his own gorilla children that will then be raised. There's a lot of violence between chimpanzees, including domestic violence, which was documented about a decade ago when a mm -hmm. chimpanzee took a specific kind of stick and broke it up in a certain way, then went right over to uh, one of the females and started beating on her. So um, this kind of- Bonobos are Bonobos are very different. Yeah, they're the happy chimps. They're the lovemaking chimps. It's, and it's all about uh, sex and free love and, and just 
uh, how else can you describe it? Why can't it, we have all species behave the same way that bonobos do? Well, I, I'm sh that, that might be a problem in, in, in terms of humans. STDs, but, but there are other ways that we could greet each other at, <laughs> other than licking each other's genitals when we come across each other on the street. <laughs> uh, this might be a family show, I'm sorry. But, but there are other ways of doing that um, that, that are peaceful. Uh, I, I think that violence was probably present in early hunter-gatherer societies, but it wasn't, it almost certainly was, in fact, but, but it, it wasn't institutionalized violence, and that began with the advent of agriculture. Uh -huh. So the advent of agriculture is between 10 and 13,000 years ago. Jared Diamond and others have said that that was the worst development in the history of humanity. Agriculture. Correct. <laughs> How do you interpret the Second Amendment? Well, hold on. Let's let's. I think might say, well, why is that? Why why agriculture? And what happened with agriculture is larger groups of human beings settled down, and a class-based society resulted. So you had the class that were the artisans, the class that was the farmers, uh, the class that was the rulers, which was usually just a very few individuals. And then you had the warrior class. Mm -hmm. uh, agricultural societies would take over a certain large area of land, usually with very fertile soil, and other agricultural societies either out of greed or wanting better soil or better land or because their own land had been ravaged by some climatic disaster or whatnot would come and invade them and we were able to develop stronger and stronger weapons. Um, but the developments in, in warfare and weaponry have occurred relatively rapidly. So if you go back 3,500 years ago, we had bronze weapons, about 1,900 years ago, iron weapons. In the 9th century, 9th century in China, they invented bombs. Um, and in the 13th century, rockets. Now fortunately, a lot of those discoveries were sort of not disseminated to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, the next big development in warfare was the balloon in 1783 by the Montgolfier brothers. And that was used by a Prussian general who thought, hmm, I can be in the air now yeah. and I can drop weapons on opposing troops. Uh, then in the Napoleonic Wars at the beginning of the 1800s, uh, there were those who said, hmm, we can make bombs better than simple projectiles that carry weight and might be launched by a trebuchet or something you'd find in the Middle Ages by loading them up with explosives and shrapnel so that when they strike their targets, they explode and pieces of metal or nails or whatnot will impale and injure more victims. Um, that's just the beginning of the 1800s. Then go to 1903, Kitty Hawk, we have airplanes, and really just within, um, what, 30 years, 32 years, we have nuclear weapons. So a massive increase in the firepower of humanity and its ability to kill itself and to kill other humans. There's something about this species, that, that humans, and how they kill each other in mass. Right, and it makes you wonder if the species itself is not doomed. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons for that is because the weapons that are available, the weapons of mass destruction, be they biological weapons like anthrax and glanders and tularemia, be they chemical weapons, be they nuclear weapons, that are becoming increasingly easy to produce through things like synthetic biology or the acquisition of nuclear material on the black market and making your own uh, nuclear weapon. Um, what might do us in might not necessarily be state-sponsored wars, but might be a few rogue terrorists who mm. obtain access to this technology um, who cause massive death and destruction. But if you look at the epidemiology of warfare, how people died in wars, up until the beginning of the 1900s, about 85 to 90 percent of casualties in war were among combatants because it was basically soldiers walking at each other and they'd have swords or maces or hammers or clubs if they were, you know, cavemen and they would just sort of beat each other until they died and then we had guns and they'd sort of walk at each other with their guns and when they stopped shooting then they'd just slam their muskets into each other. But that really changed with the development of air warfare and submarine warfare and missiles that could be launched. And um, now in contemporary wars, 85 to 90 percent of casualties are among civilians. Well, because of man's brain and his ability to think, uh, he can do mass executions and ma mass killings, right. which is something about different uh, than 
oh, never mind, I lost my point here. No, but I, I think I think you were about to make a good point, which is is it's not only true at the at the large level of things like nuclear weapons, but just assault weapons mm -hmm. that can fire so many rounds per second. Um, is this something we really need to hunt deer with? Um, is this something that any citizen really needs to have, but a kid can go into a high school and mow down 50 people within the span of 30 seconds or less? Are we interested in, in, in eliminating the human race, that uh, species of, of, of life? So we better take a break now. I know that's really <laughs> sobering. Well, we'll bring in we'll bring in the kid who. So let's take scripts. a break, and then we'll bring in Maddie, and we will talk about who she is. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Look who's here. Who is that? This is Madeline. There's two Maddies. I know. <laughs> there's one on the screen and there's one there. And there's one there and there's another daddy. Uh -huh. tell, tell the camera what you've got coming up in a week. It's your birthday. Birthday. What do you want for your birthday? Blaze. Blaze, tell the camera. Say it loudly. I want Blaze for my birthday. You like you like Blaze and the Monster Machines. Who are your favorite characters? <laughs> who's the one who's the mechanic that does all the fixing of the cars? Gabby. That's Gabby. Yeah, she's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh huh. And what what you, are you excavating there? Hold on, we should get you a Kleenex, sweetheart. No, I don't need one. Okay. This is what doctors do to your nose. Oh yeah, the doctors look up your nose. Where are we gonna go for dinner tonight after this? Do you like P.F. Chang's? Yeah. Why do you like it? Do you get your own little cartoon there? Oh, you gonna do your zombie face? Oh. Now, now, what does a zombie <laughs> say? Show, do your zombie walk, okay? What do you say? Hello. <laughs> what does a zombie say? I don't know. <laughs> He's gonna eat your brains. Do you wanna dance a little? Okay, look at the camera. Turn around. Dance. <laughs> oh, what a okay. dancer. What Thank you for dance. coming on tonight, Maddie. You're a breath of fresh air. Will you go out with Grandma now? <laughs> I love you, Bugs. <laughs> okay. We've been waiting all morning for that, all day. And yeah, she's terrific. She's beautiful. Mm. And she's been on a number of times, and we're going to have her on periodically uh, to, to chart her growth and being is both more and more beautiful as time goes by. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's go back to our questions as well as out. Okay. I got to get her an agent, I tell you. <laughs> <it's gonna. laughs> uh, uh, what are the, st are the statistics related to gun violence? The statistics related to gun violence, homicides, suicides, accidental shooting, et cetera? Yeah, I, I think I've given most of those. Uh, just to recapitulate, 33,000 deaths in the U.S., 84,000 injuries, that's per year, $230 billion in health costs. Uh, 25 times the homicide rate in the U.S. compared with other developed countries, eight times the suicide rate. Probably one of the most sobering statistics is that if you look at all the people who have died from gun violence since 1968, so uh, suicides, homicides, and accidental shootings, that's 1.4 million. If you tally up all the soldiers that have died in all the U.S.'s wars from the Revolutionary War through even the Civil War where 675,000 people died, that comes to 1.2 million. So just in the last, would that be uh, 60 years almost, more people have died from gun violence than died in battle in all the wars that we fought as a country. Mm, 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 mm. Uh, what is known about the risks of having guns in the home? You mentioned that earlier on. Right, right. 
And it, it, it is very risky. So again, if you're going to have a gun in the home, uh, you need to keep it locked. You need to keep the ammunition separate from it. You need to keep it completely away from children, um, locked up ideally in a safe. And uh, if you're going to go out shooting, skeet shooting, hunting, target shooting, um, whatever you like to do, uh, it's important that you teach those who are shooting gun safety, that you teach gun, children gun safety. And uh, I can imagine th that that is kind of fun. I actually, I really enjoyed skeet shooting. I thought it was a blast. But when I was doing it, I was worried just when I had the gun in my hand that if I suddenly tripped and fell mm -hmm. and I leaned backwards that I could send a bullet through, you know, Maddie wasn't there then, but I could have sent it through someone else's kid. So I was very sort of on edge mm -hmm. because all it takes is an accident to lead to a, a, a tragedy that cannot be, that just cannot be undone. Next question, what role has the NRA, National Rifle Association, played in perpetuating gun violence, the NRA. Yeah. What do you think of the NRA? I don't have a very high opinion of them. Mm -hmm. I, I think the NRA actually started out as a very good organization. They were an organization of hunters that got together to exchange information about how to use guns safely and which guns were best for what types of hunting. I was a member for about five years. I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, they were interested in, in target shooting and yeah. things like that that are, that are uh, um, very important. And then throughout the 1950s, 1960s, there was a great emphasis on gun safety in the NRA. Mm -hmm. uh, but then something changed. And nowadays, the NRA is basically, at its core, a front organization for weapons manufacturers who contribute anywhere between 20 and $60 million, or, or contributed anywhere between 20 and $60 million over the last 10 years to the NRA. Um, the NRA spends about $3 million lobbying, lobbying. Uh, Congress, and much of its lobbying is not representative, for, is, is for laws that are not representative of what its members want. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority, again, of NRA members want things like background checks. Uh, they don't want the, the mentally ill to be able to carry guns. They don't want people who are have restraining orders against them to be able to get guns. Mm -hmm. They want to close the gun show loophole. Um, but the NRA, in, in not following its own members' wishes, does this because basically it has become a front organization for weapons manufacturers who know that they can use it and it's tremendous political power and the fact that many of those who are in the NRA leadership basically rotate through the federal government mm -hmm. um, uh, in that sort of unending circular cycle and, and, and they um, have 500,000 members, uh, only 30,000 donors. Um, but so they perpetuate gun violence, the NRA does? Absolutely, by, by, by stopping common sense gun laws and by promoting the sale of newer, fancier, more effective uh, weapons with greater firepower, for which there is, in many cases, no logical need uh, in the world. And, and something is sick about our nation at heart if we can't tackle this problem that's killing innocent people, um, particularly women and children, um, but, but all members of society, there's something clearly wrong when other countries have democracies, well-functioning yeah. mm -hmm. democracies, with a happy citizenry, and do well on many measures of, of uh, social progress. In fact, almost all of them do me better on measures of social progress mm -hmm. than we do, education, healthcare, et cetera. Um, but, but their citizens are happier. In surveys of happiness that are done throughout Europe and other parts of the developed world, citizens elsewhere are just happier. Um, and so it's not just guns, though. It's just, it's just sort of tamping things down. It's getting people to not escalate arguments. It's solving the gang problem in the inner cities, improving the lives and the educations of those who live in poverty so that they don't feel like their only outlet is a gang. Um, it's improving what, the life of everybody. Okay, what policies might we enact to reduce gun violence? What, what policies? In how would we do that? Yeah, uh, I think we have to take a more aggressive approach to closing the gun show loophole, getting those crazy weapons off of the market entirely, limiting access of the mentally ill, tackling gun violence. Have we had any progress in that direction no, at all? No, and, and we won't for four years at least. We and why is that? Simple as why that. We have unless any progress it happens because at the state of their, their lobbying and the, the money. Well, they because spend. we're going to have a, a Republican Congress, probably a Republican Supreme Court, and a Republican president um, who's supported by the NRA. 
So if anything, there's going to be some retrogression in the laws. There's going to be more open carry laws. It's going to be uh, laws that are going to make it legal to basically carry a gun pretty much wherever you want. Um, I, but there was a time when Republicans were not uh, like you're, you're talking uh, now. About no, not at all. Area. No, we we and much of this is the corporate influence on government. Again, the, the gun lobby is just another corporation that's mm -hmm. doing the same thing other corporations do: is buy off Congress persons to have their the types of legislation written that they want, or to lobby for indifference and lobby for lethargy so that things don't change. Um, but I think we also need to, coming back to your question, um, do something more about domestic violence in this country, mm -hmm. uh, be more serious about child abuse, but just to improve the lot of those today who grow up and go to poor schools. We need better educated um, children, and, and that calls for more funding for education, uh, to improve the status of women, to, to stop the legal and political and educational marginalization that they face and to look at things like why are they still earning 69 percent on the do 69 cents on the dollar which is what they were earning in 1968 mm -hmm. come on America get with it and until we prove this improve the status of women and get more female representatives in our state and national legislature um, because they, they just they get it more they're, I, I hate to say it, they have less testosterone, they're more maternal, but they, they, have, they have more wisdom, I think. I have another question for you. <laughs> Do you anticipate an increase or decrease in gun violence with a Trump presidency? Uh, I, I hate to say it. Uh, it's, it's unquestionably going to be an increase um, because uh, this election ha has just shocked me and left me more depressed than probably at any time in my life. Really? And I think um, we basically elected a Either person alone. who's a serial liar, who's an admitted sex offender, who's a racist, xenophobic, misogynistic, a uh, person who has cheated his employees, who's failed at business, who's never held an elected office, who has very limited understanding of how government works, of world geography, of how uh, the socio-political order works worldwide. Is this why you voted for him? And no understanding of science. No, no I think it's sad. I think it's, it's good. the rest of the world thinks that we're nuts. Yeah. Um, it's, it's going to damage our position of leadership in the world. It's going to basically mean that the only reason the U.S. is going to be a world leader is because of our military might and our economic might, which will tumble, unfortunately, because of many of his policies. Now, of course, that was pretty true under Obama also, but there was a certain level of respect accorded to the United States. We're going to have the only leader in, in the, the world who doesn't believe in climate change, and that's a massive problem facing the next generation. So in terms of more violence, I think the fact that we elected a racist, half of us voted for it, is something that we have to confront. And I've seen shows where they talk about uh, how do we talk to our kids about this? And um, unfortunately, the way it's presented in the media is, well, it was a very heated political campaign and you have to tell your kids that there are going to be disagreements and sometimes people are going to you know, have really loud arguments. And No, you, you have to tell your kids, I'm sorry, but half of the people who voted who live in your country either support his racist ideology and his misogyny and how he feels it's okay to treat women, or they were willing to stand by and let such an individual vote. And in their passivity, in their accedence to this vileness, are a party to it. And you have to say, I'm sorry, you live in a country that is not the country that the Constitution and the Founding Fathers represented or envisaged. envisioned. Um, and I can't imagine having to explain this. I was trying to explain this to my niece. She was almost in tears the other night. Yeah. Um, and, and imagine if you're trying to explain this to a child who's Hispanic, who's Latino, mm -hmm. uh, who's LGBTQ, uh, whose parents might be undocumented, but who themselves is a citizen and knows no other part of the world and grew mm -hmm. up here and it might be 16 years old or 13 and be told your parents might be deported. Imagine explaining this to a Muslim. Um, I think the only thing we can do, those who are rational and, and who don't have the outlet of other citizenships as I do, 
um, is, is to raise our voices and say, no, th this type of abusive person is not one that you compromise with. How did we get to this situation? Um, how did we get here? Yeah. I, I, how did we I th end up with a, it? I think a lot of, of Trump voters were, were naturally quite concerned about the economy, concerned about the role of Wall Street, despite, despite the fact that um, Bannon from Breitbart was a former executive at Goldman Sachs and were bringing in the same old politicians from before. I think a lot of people who voted for Trump are going to be sadly disappointed. Many are going to lose their health insurance. Many are going to realize that the coal jobs have gone away and are not coming back. Mm -hmm. um, and it's simply capitalism that's going to drive that. Nobody's investing in coal anymore. But I think we got there because many people felt marginalized, felt angry, and because the media presented uh, a race between two candidates, both of whom had their own malfeasances, but they equated in terms of time spent covering that malfeasance, someone who had poor judgment in using a type of server in which some emails might have shared compromised information with someone whose violence and whose promotion of violence at his, at his rallies, you know, encouraging people to, to beat up and punch other people, and even calling out certain reporters. What's the real reason is, that Trump uh, got as many votes as he did? You know, I, I'd like to not think it, but I can't help but think because that's the kind of country we live in. Mm. The, the, How those, did the country get to be this way? The, the, How did the country get to be this way, this kind of country we live in? How is that? Um, well, I, I, as I said again, I think part of it is, was how he and Hillary were presented in the media. Um, her malfeasance doesn't compare to his malfeasance. Mm -hmm. um, but there was equal time allotted to both. And I think they wanted ratings. They wanted controversy. But you got a choice between but, Hillary and, and Trump. Does mm -hmm. that speak that we have a democracy? Oh, no. And I, we could have instant runoff voting like Australia and Ireland have, um, which would give us a whole array of, of choices. We say could a few, have... Say a few words about that. Yeah, that's, no, that's, about that's it. a great question, too, of how we got there. Because instant... Well, I'll mention instant runoff voting briefly. So with the way that works is if there's four candidates, say a far right, a far left, and two uh, moderate conservatives, say, um, you rank your candidates. So if I wanted to vote for Gore uh, or Nader, then Gore than Bush the Lesser than a John Bircher in the 2000 election I, could have election, I could have ranked them that way. Uh, they would have tallied up all the votes. Whoever was in fourth place, they would have redistributed that person's votes. If that was, say, Nader, they would have gone to the second choice, would be Gore. You'd work your way down. Yeah. Finally, you get it down to one candidate. That way, you don't have to go into the voting booth and hold your nose. You can actually vote your values. Mm -hmm. um, I think part of the reason we got here was because certain people were too apathetic to vote. Uh, of the and, and protesters, of the protesters arrested in the Portland protests. Why were they apathetic? A vast majority of those they discovered did not even vote. So where were you? But of course, the people who were arrested were the anarchists and the others who came out to take advantage of, of what were peaceful protests. But, mm -hmm. but for those of you who didn't vote, where were you? Why don't we have a parliamentary democracy? Why do we have a situation every four years where the candidates focus on Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, and ignore visiting large swaths of the country or talking to citizens there because they know that they've either won or lost certain states? Why? I'm well, it's because of the crazy a electoral here. I'm college. I'm asking you a series of questions. It's the crazy electoral college. And how did we get that? Well, I don't know the history of how it came into being, um, I have to confess. But How it, come we didn't have uh, uh, Bernie Sanders and his thinking and his views on, on things as a, a viable candidate? Oh, the media. The media just basically blacklisted and made him sound he was crazy, he was a democratic socialist, or even worse, just a socialist. Uh, they made him look like a crazy old man, where if you sat down and listened to him, he, he spoke very cogently. He was a very intelligent candidate. Um, he spoke he spoke to the needs of the underserved. He spent his life fighting for the rights of African Americans and others, um, many of whom went with Hillary. Um, he sp spent his life supporting the common man, the workers. You said um, the magic word, the media. You said that three or four times. Right. So someone suggested that the media should be treated as an equal branch of government. Well, they're, they're, they're supposed to be essentially the, the, the fourth branch of government. And keep supposed to be. Honest. But the problem is I listened to a lot of the reports during the election and even afterwards. So, for instance, when Melania Trump gave her talk about her issue, should she become first lady, would be cyberbullying. 
And this was a report from one of the, the mainstream news outlets. It was something like this. Uh, there are some who have found it ironic that Melania's comments uh, were about cyberbullying when certain individuals have interpreted some of, Dr., er, some of Donald Trump's tweets as possibly representing cyberbullying. Now, just the way that's framed as possibly representing cyberbullying, no, his tweets, his tweets involved cyberbullying. Let's just say it, because if we don't, we minimize the suffering of those that he's mocked. Mm -hmm. And the fact now that he's calling out specific reporters that his, that his supporters are yelling out, the fact that so many high schools have seen people show up. One of my friends, they showed up with pickup trucks and Confederate flags yelling for Hispanics to go home and we're going to build the wall and this is Trump Nation. This is just here in Oregon. This is happening all over the country. The KKK is planning a celebratory parade. Yeah. This, these are the types of individuals whose latent racism is bubbling to the ugly surface. And part of this is the fault also, I have to say it because it's one of my, my whipping boys, is corporations. And because corporations oh, really? and the rich have a vested interest in turning one marginalized group, say poor southern whites who hate Hispanics, turning one marginalized group who make poor salaries, are largely uninsured, have poor schools, and making them blame it all on the Mexicans. That Is the media the unbiased when it considers uh, the information they put out about uh, Hillary versus Trump? They're going simply for ratings, I think. And anything that caused controversy that they could, they could talk about was simply great. Simply for ratings rather than being supporting Trump's views, generally speaking? Well, I, I think that they, they weren't aggressive enough in calling Trump's views exactly what they are. This man is a racist, he's dangerous, and, and, and what really scares me, as we talked about in the last show, is he has all the textbook characteristics of a sociopath. Yes. Remember, this is one individual, and the only thing between him and 45 minutes nuclear annihilation of the planet are two Air Force officers who have to turn the keys. And if they flunk the simulations, they're replaced. So if he wakes up at 3 a.m. one night and has some perceived slight from you name it, and decides, I'm going to get that bastard. I think we need There's to no look stopping at, it. I think we need to, uh, to think about how it is we have the situation going on. I offered two or three times, considering the media and its power, mm -hmm. and if, if you just uh, talk about Trump all the time, positive or negative, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter, then that's supporting them and letting people mm -hmm. see what Trump, Trump's about so mm -hmm. that then they will support Trump because he says some things that are dog whistle things mm -hmm. Like, uh, oh, never mind, I won't go into that. Well, I think, I, think it's, I think that's a good point because you know, there are some people who thought that they were doing the right thing because they're, they're very anti-choice and they wanted abortion outlawed. And so they were willing to maybe make that trade-off of less fetuses aborted versus increased violence against African Americans and LGBTQ individuals and women and uh, deportations and disruptions of families. And maybe that's the calculus they use. But, but this is not a religious man. This is a thrice married individual who uh, is not a model of the type of Christianity that I know about from reading the Gospels. How long is Trump gonna be in command before things change? Well, it's my hope that he's going to be drawn into court by uh, one of um, the victims of his, his sexual assaults for which the statute of limitations hasn't gone away. But he's packing the courts. Well, no, I, I, what, what I'm really hoping will happen is that someone will come forward. There'll be some sort of video, ideally evidence, of a sexual assault. It'll be within the statute of limitations and he'll get sent to jail. Now, what that'll mean is there'll be a President Pence, and, and he has his own, uh, but he, he's not a sociopath. That's the difference. What you're su suggesting is gonna happen to, 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 uh, to Trump isn't about to happen. One can dream. <laughs> <laughs> so you're looking for some way to take him out? Take, are you meaning I'm uh, suggesting take, that someone take, assassin? Take, no, no, I, I would no, not no, suggest not, that. Not, not assault him, not, not uh, kill him, I'm talking about uh, remove him from the presidency? Well, I, I think um, what could happen over the four years of his presidency could be so absolutely devastating that hopefully there are those in the Republican Party who will wake up 
and stop their toady, uh, toady sort of following of him and glomming onto him and saying, it's okay, he's just do this. You know, and all these toadies will say to themselves, whoa, we need to take the long view of the Republican Party. Will it be too late? This person is going to destroy the country and they'll impeach him. Will it be too late? I don't know. It depends Before on when they decide to impeach him. Goes to a complete fascist state. Uh, that's, you know, a lot of this looks like things looked at the time when Hitler was elected. It's, it's very scary times for a lot of people and the, the individuals that he's um, bringing with him. Uh, we're all excited. We're going to need to stop because we're running out of time. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm very concerned for the future of this country and, and um, there's a, a large part of me that, that doesn't want to stay. Um, and where will you go? Your other two uh, citizenships? Uh, Australia, Canada, I'm eligible for Irish, which makes me potentially EU citizen if Ireland doesn't leave the EU. I've got lots of options, fortunately. But, you know, and I, you're I, staying here. Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I still believe in the ideals of the United States. I, I think the Constitution is a fabulous document, and we've changed it some, which is why we can also change the Second Amendment. You know, women vote, African Americans. You have about citizens. 30 seconds to say goodbye and tell the viewers Here's what, you can what your do. final thought is. Show as much love as you can to marginalized individuals. Go up to Muslims on the street, Hispanics, Latinos, gay people, African Americans, say, I'm with you. I feel your pain. I'm not going to stand down in the face of this misogyny and racism. I am going to support you in all that you do, and we're going to have this person out of office, if not sooner, in four years, and we're going to make this the nation that it should be. And I'd say to all of those who voted for Trump, please, look at the interests of the United States. Look at your own self-interest. This is not a person who cares about you. And this we'll do something about gun violence. He's divisive. He lives on hate. And we can be a nation of love. We can set an example to the world. We can be the exemplar that we should be in the United States. Please work with each other, spread the love, no hate. How about a couple of PSAs, Mr. Director? Okay, thank you for watching. Remember KFC, not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. Don's KFC, kind, friendly, and charitable. Be kind, be friendly, and be charitable to you too, and I've got you all depressed. <laughs> nah, I'm gonna go have dinner with my mom and my daughter. I can be better yeah, than that. Better, yeah? Yeah.